Again, thank you everyone for joining. My name is Drew. I'm the marketing manager for Cobiton, and today we are hosting our webinar, Unique Challenges in FinTech, a QA Rockstars approach. I am joined by some fabulous QA professionals today. Uh, Jan Acosta, who is the senior manager of quality enablement at QTE Banking, as well as Paul Grizzafi, who is the principal automation architect at Magenic. And lastly, Crystal Escalante from Green Sky was supposed to be on the webinar today, but she had a last minute scheduling conflict. And so unfortunately, she won't be able to make it, but we will continue on. Uh, that said, we will review the rules very quickly. Each panelist will have exactly two minutes to answer each question, and all audience questions will be answered at the end. So please do feel free to submit your questions throughout the entire webinar, and just understand that we will get to them towards the end. All right, so uh, with the first question, uh, we will start with Jan. Uh, in your opinion, Jan, what are the most challenging aspects of QA and FinTech? Thanks, Drew, and hello, everyone. Um, so I think there are a few things that make testing in the FinTech world a challenge. First, uh, we do a lot of integration with third parties, um, which naturally means a lot of dependencies. If there's a change with a core vendor, or with some third-party integration and something stops working, to the end user, it looks like we're broken, when in reality, it may have been a change that we weren't aware of or that we didn't anticipate. Um, so that's, that's one challenge. Um, secondly, is kind of the natural complexity of our feature set, especially when you're talking about business banking. For personal, like home banking, things are pretty straightforward doing transfers or scheduling a payment or checking your balance. But when you get into the business banking world, you get into entitlements and roles and permissions, and it's a much, much more sophisticated workflow, which lends itself to more complex test scenarios. And, and probably the last challenging aspect is the fact that, that the financial world tends to be very risk averse. Um, and that makes it a challenge for us to get our financial institutions to want to be on the cutting edge and take new features frequently. Um, you know, they don't like it when, when you know, there's, there's risk and there's the potential for things to go wrong. And so we're kind of constantly pushing, you know, to keep them moving forward too. Awesome. Paul, would you like to add any color to that? Um, I'm going to echo all of those things. Um, Jan has far more, uh, uh, experience in fintech than I do, but the little bit of time that I spent with fintech clients, I've seen all of those things that she mentioned there. Uh, and, and definitely it, it sort of mirrors some of the things that I've seen in healthcare as well, where they are very risk averse. Uh, so there, there's, um, there's an aspect of that. And along with that risk aversion, it makes some of the testability a little bit harder uh, because some of the things that we would like to have in from a controllability or an observability standpoint, uh, that there's very, people are reluctant to put those in simply because they may be used for, for, um, for ill-gotten gain, if you will. Uh, and I, I don't want to undersell the point about dealing with third parties as well. Uh, most of the, the systems that we work in today, FinTech or not, we're going to be dealing with third parties for analytics and payments and, and, and uh, maps and all sorts of other things there. And that makes the, the ecosystem that you're testing in far more complex and far less controllable because at some point you're either working with their test environment, uh, your third party's test environment, or you're, you're doing some service virtualization with that endpoint, or you're faking the endpoint out yourself. And you can only test so much and model so much before you start getting into, we think it works this way, and we're going to have to monitor and be prepared to, to rehabilitate once we go live if things aren't working out the way we expected. Got it. Got it. Okay. Um, moving on to the next question. So, Jan, can you tell me a bit about your process for gathering and documenting requirements, uh, specifically when dealing with some of the more sensitive or complex facets of your mobile application? Sure. So, our process is the same for both mobile and desktop apps. Um, we put a lot of effort and focus into user experience and user design. 
Um, we're very fortunate to have a large in-house user experience research center, actually kind of a, a part of the ground floor of the building that we're in. Um, and so we have the opportunity to bring in customers, bring in prospects, bring in end users, just to try stuff out. You know, give them a phone, give them a tablet, let them sit down, you know, and pull up a browser, log in and, and watch how they do things, watch where they get stuck. Um, we also, you know, occasionally our, um, our product and design folks will, you know, put posters up on the walls near the break room and say, hey, you know, look at this. Is it intuitive to you? Um, because the, the thing about banking is, you know, we are our own customers. I mean, hopefully we all have savings accounts and checking accounts. And, and so you have to try stuff, um, you know, and, and look at it not only as the engineering team that's building it, but also as the recipients of the, of the end result. And so um, in doing all of that, we do it to try to make anything from the most simple feature to the most complex feature intuitive and user-friendly. Um, regardless of kind of the, the, you know, the magic that's going on underneath. Got it, got it. And Paul, how about you? So for me, I've not been in the, um, and again, when, with my role as a consultant with, with clients, I've not been in the role for um, gathering and documenting the requirements. They've usually kind of been there by the time I got there. But to, to sort of springboard off of that, where I have found some, some challenges with complexity is in the, in the domain space, where the financial world, especially if you start getting into taxes or some or, or stock trading, uh, it there's a whole lot to learn before you can even start speaking the vocabulary uh, w with your colleagues. Much less being able to really uh, add add a, um, something something viable and valuable into a product itself. So gathering that information sometimes is pretty easy because it is fairly well known until you start getting to the specific implementation of some of the well-known stuff that's when the, the the learning curve can get quite steep if we don't have the ability to get those not necessarily product requirements but sort of the implementation requirements and the sort of the de rigueur aspect of how the particular team of the organization does their work on a daily or releasely basis. Great, okay. So Jen, tell us a bit about how you distinguish between high and low priority business scenarios, and then what type of business domain uh, knowledge factors into that person? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. So I think there's a couple of things that factor into prioritization for me, Drew. Um, first, we need to understand how the feature or the enhancement request is going to impact our customers. You know, is it something that 90% of them will want and it has the potential to help them meet their goals or help increase, increase their revenue and help their end users? Um, or is it more of a niche thing that has low, you know, potential return? Um, you know, that, that plays a big role. Uh, and then complexity and risk, I think, also have to be taken into account, too. You know, what's it going to take to really understand it? What's it going to take to build it? What's it going to take to ensure that we're delivering with quality? Um, you know, we're fortunate, and this is something that, that Paul mentioned just a minute ago, we're fortunate to have um, a good number of our team members here at Q2 that come from a banking background, you know, maybe they um, previously worked at a bank or at a credit union, and, and so they have that that richness, well, literally, maybe figuratively too, you know, the, in, in the depth of, of kind of domain knowledge. Um, and that certainly helps, you know, us understand the business need as well as the intricacies of, of how we're going to implement it and test it. Great. And Paul, how about you? So again, a lot of times these priorities are laid out by the time um, I would get involved. Uh, but if they're not, what, what I usually hear, or even when they are, what, what I usually hear back is you can't break anything. Everything that's working now still has to work regardless of what you do. And then we start you know, peeling that onion a little bit and untangling those Christmas tree lights and then saying, okay, what do you mean? What can't break? What has to keep working? And in every scenario, there's some bread and butter 
business. Uh, there's some piece of, of or workflow or something that if you break that, we are dead in the water and people are going to come after us with the torches and the pitchforks. Um, to to equate it to an e-commerce scenario, if you can't buy a product with a credit card, that release is not good. That deployment is not good. Just stop right there. So we would start testing around those particular aspects. So distinguishing between higher and lower, those things that are going to cause people injury, either physical injury, financial in, in, injury, uh, reputational in, in injury, um, and when I say people, either the clients or the company itself, those tend to be the higher, the higher priority items uh, than in the ones where there is going to be less damage or the damage can be recovered or recouped very quickly. Those tend to be the lower scenarios as well. And it's going to depend on which environment you're in. People are very sensitive about health. People are very sensitive about money. Um, if you don't get a product that you ordered the day you expected it to come in, you're irritated, but that probably doesn't mean that you're going to uh, to die because of it unless it was, let's say, your insulin. And then now we're back into to healthcare. Right. That makes sense, uh, especially when talking about kind of dire scenarios, which leads to the next question here. Um, Jan, so when you finally do settle on the prioritization of these business scenarios, uh, specifically when you're looking at the higher priority situations, do you attempt to test every possible permutation and com combination uh, to cover your bases based on the high stakes involved? Um, and if not, how, you, how do you decide what not to test while mitigating the most risk? Yep. So, Drew, this is my most favorite question. I, I love it when people ask about, you know, do you test everything or what do you test? So, test strategy and automation strategy are critically important. I mean, I, I can't stress that enough. I, I'm a very strong believer in combinatorial test design and having a well-defined test design methodology that you can use to identify the best minimum set of tests to execute, and then and only then do you look at automation to improve your efficiency. Test effectiveness has to come before test efficiency, because if you don't have that right set of tests, if you don't know that your coverage is good, automation just makes stuff go fast. It does not make your testing better. And so it's totally physically impossible to test everything especially when you are looking at running across every browser, every mobile device, you know, that fits out in the wild. I mean, uh, for us personally, you know, we support Android, you know, 5 through latest and iOS 10 through latest. And then just, just in the mobile front, when you look at the, you know, different vendors and the tablets versus phones versus, what you know, watches and everything else that people have, I mean, it, you just can't, you can't do it all. Um, and so you have to have a strategy, um, you know, and a design paradigm that you're using to make sure that you have good coverage, you've got the right set of tests, and then you automate for efficiency. Um, and, and going back to something that Paul said a minute ago, people get really mad when you screw up their money, like really, really mad. Um, because it could have been, you know, their their food money for the week. It could have been the electric bill or their house note, and there's repercussions. Um, so we have to make sure that we don't just, you know, quote unquote, test what sounds like the right thing to test. You have to have a, a strategy and a design um, going into it. Uh, and so, if for those that are that are listening, if you're not familiar with combinatorial test design, please please look it up, Google it. Um, because I, I think that um, it's something that's sorely missing in a lot of organizations. Thank you for letting Great. me get on my box. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was very insightful. I think the key takeaway there is effectiveness before efficiency. So yes. uh, definitely an important caveat. Uh, Paul, what would you like to add to that? Well, first, I'm going to elbow her off the soapbox, and I'm going to say that she and I would get along very well professionally, I think. Sounds like we've got a lot of alignment there. Um, I, yes, I would like to just echo, amplify. I I'll just say I'm going to repeat everything she just said, um, and then I'll expound a, a little bit because she's dead on. You can't test everything. It's kind of like we talked about earlier. Um, when you start getting into especially interconnected systems, never mind the ones that are outside of your building. Talk about just the ones that are 
in your building on different teams or in different organizations that you're interacting with. Everything changes once you start losing oversight uh, of, of those pieces. Then you start worrying about timing. You start worrying about what happens when this thing goes down or this message comes in before this one and this one. We start getting race conditions that, that, are, that are unhandled. Um, yeah, we, we, we can't test everything because we can't think of everything. Uh, we're flawed. We're humans, right? We're, there's only so much we can do. We can say, hey, great. Let's let the computers go and figure out what we should be testing. That's great, too. But even they're going to be flawed because they were programmed by, you know, humans. So <laughs> and we make mistakes. So once we understand we as the organization and we as the, the business segment of the organization, understand that we're not going to test everything and there will be problems. What do we do next? OK, let's prioritize. The combinatorial approach is great. Risk-based testing, great. The ability to minimize the impact when you do have an issue. So the whole low cost of failure and low cost of change, those are going to help because we know we're going to have problems. We can't catch everything. We can't do everything. So what do we do when there is a problem encountered in the wild and having that, that mitigation plan in place and having an architecture and implementation and a strategy for making it so that you can containerize and compartmentalize compartmentalize um, problems, you know, draw a wall around them so that they only affect a subset of the users or they only affect a subset of the system. So maybe your performance goes 50% of what it was, but everybody can still get their job done. It just takes longer. Got it. Got it. Okay. Thanks for that. Moving on here, um, and actually, actually skipped one. There we go. Okay, so uh, again to you, Jan. How do you handle the functional testing of your application, uh, specifically when monetary transactions and sensitive data are involved? Yep. Um, so in our test environments, we use fake data. Um, it, I will tell y'all um, for for anyone that's listening that hasn't tested, uh, you know, in the fintech world, it's actually kind of fun um, because I can log into our test bank and our QA environments, and all of a sudden I have $5 million in my savings account. Um, now I will tell you my real savings account doesn't usually have that much money in it, um, so it's kind of nice to pretend. Um, and, and so then, you know, you can kind of move stuff around, exercise the application, do what you need to do, um, but it's not always easy to do things like loans. Um, or maybe credit card transactions, that gets trickier because you can't fake a loan. Um, and so for those features or, you know, test scenarios where, you know, we can't hack the database and do it ourselves, um, we rely a lot on mocking um, to help us do the testing. So, you know, if it's with a third party or another internal service that we don't have access to or that's still in development, um, we can use mocking to try to test some of those scenarios. Um, you know, there's very tight controls um, on who has access to real customer data, um, and, and we have to be respectful of that and kind of do what we can with what we have, um, and then, um, you know, do things like, like mocking um, for the other scenarios. Yeah, that, that all yeah, sounds very familiar. Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Sorry. That, that all sounds very familiar. Um, I, I can't say that I've done much of it in the in the fintech world, but it mirrors things that I've I've done in the healthcare world because I, I did like a three year stint in in healthcare, and it's very similar to that. You can't get the production data that's very tightly controlled. Um, you can try obfuscating it, and certain things can be obfuscated and it, it it can be certified. But then you start getting into the hard parts where okay, you can't just randomly change what the start and the end date of that hospital stay was because after a certain duration it goes into a different category. So then all this data integrity stuff has to come in. So it gets very complicated when we start talking about um, mocked data and 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 synthetic data. It, it there, again, we start getting into, I can't test everything because I can't think of everything, or in some cases, it's not viable for me to implement everything because it, it, it's not economically feasible, or it's not technologically feasible, or it would just take too long, right? The, the schedule is not feasible. 
So it gets really challenging in there, but you have to work with some amount of mocked data simply because you're not allowed to have the real data. Right, and you wouldn't want everyone having access to that clearly as a customer. So that's probably in all of our best interest. Um, okay, so both of you have somewhat tapped on a few points um, regarding this next question, but I'll go ahead and ask it for the sake of uh, of the time here. So when using mock data, how close to real life scenarios can you get with it? And then how do you reduce the margin of error when transitioning between that mock data and live data? Yeah, so, so I think it's critically important to have clear contracts and good communication between the parties. If we have a solid understanding of what data is being passed back and forth and everyone respects the contracts, then mocking can be a great way of developing in parallel between teams or, or from you know, internal to with a third party and reducing dependencies and you know, any drama that might come when the mocks are removed and, and you test for real. If you don't have good contracts, you know, if they're unclear or if they're just plain missing, um, then all bets are off because you know it's it's like we're we're speaking different languages and um and it's going to make it integration and in subsequent testing much much more difficult so i think it's all about clear contracts and good communication right the, the contracts are absolutely essential there as well going from component to component or even subcomponent to subcomponent to subcomponent right you have to know what's going back and forth but then knowing what's in the thing that goes back and forth, that's where you have to sort of rely on what are the requirements, whatever requirements you may or may not have gotten. And then the other direction, okay, how did you implement this? So there has to be some notion of knowledge of how things were implemented. Oh, okay, you implemented it so that this is going to, to be checked against this, so we can't have too many of these. And oh, you use this type of, even down to the, you use this type of data structure, are there risks with sizable data there? Are there risks with multi-byte data there? Is there finding out what the general risks of, of a particular data structure or particular implementation are? Then you can craft some of your mock data to help exploit and exercise those aspects as well. But then again, that's where you start having to say, we can't test everything. We can't even test all the things that we think of. Is that a sufficiently high uh, priority activity to go into if so then we should mock that data if not we flag it as a risk and saying look we didn't go in and test this because mocking this data or, or whatever it was the actual testing activity was going to be more expensive take too long whatever whatever the the, the limit is there in order to deliver this to you in the time frame you've asked for it here's the risk here's what we've done here's what we've not done do you still want us to go and do this? And then it becomes this risk and business decision to say, it's okay to release without having tested that feature with 30 terabytes of data, or it's not because we know that's what's in our databases. Thanks Paul, thanks Jan for that. Um, okay, so with all this talk about data and sensitive information, I think the next logical question uh, should concern security. Uh, so with that said, Jan, how have new and advanced security measures like two-factor authentication, microservice architecture, and even fingerprint or face ID impacted your approach to security testing? And if the answer is that it's become more complicated, how do you typically get around those obstacles? Sure. So security is absolutely imperative in FinTech, right, as well as in any area where we're processing payments or, or moving someone's money or we've got their Social security number or their bank account. Um, things like uh, multi-factor authentication, touch ID, face ID are helpful to ensure that we're taking appropriate measures to protect our customers, but they do complicate testing. Not necessarily manual testing, but test automation, right? I mean, it's hard, meaning that I haven't found a good way to do um, automation with fingerprint ID or face ID, and if anyone on the phone has, I would love to be your friend and you could talk to me about it. Um, you can do the testing, right? I can pick up a phone and, and make sure that my thumbprint does, you know, authenticate or, or you know, my bright smiling face works. 
Um, but when you're trying to automate that, that's, I think, where, where it gets a little bit more complicated. Um, for example, for us, you know, one of the features of our mobile applications is um, mobile remote deposit capture. You know, so if you get a, you know, your mother writes you a check for $25 for something and you want to take a picture of that check with your phone, you can't use a, a cached picture of a check. It, it has to be a live picture. Um, and how do you automate that scenario? Um, it, it gets a little bit tricky. How do you automate with, you know, your fingerprint or face ID? Um, so the, I think the testing isn't necessarily harder, um, but it certainly presents a challenge to automation. Um, and, and those are challenges that we're still working through. So coming from an automation world, this, uh, this rings very true for me. Um, so going back to the traditional approach to get around something like CAPTCHA, uh, what typically organizations would do is they would bypass. They would either have this hard-coded test-only value that's got a switch that gets thrown before production, uh, production release that says, oh, this CAPTCHA code is always okay in the test environment. So we would type that in, go on, or we would have uh, an environment where the CAPTCHA isn't ju just isn't displayed. And we know that from an automation execution standpoint, we are doing a subset of the testing. But the reality is we're not testing reCAPTCHA or CAPTCHA at that point. We're not testing the 2FA at that point. What we're testing is, can we get through there and go test some other business logic? So again, once we understand what we're testing and understand very much like, like Jan said earlier, is that automation is going to help with the efficiency of, of testing and the way I like to look at it is it helps us be either more effective or, or more efficient at, at our jobs and that it's in support of what the, what the testers are doing. So what I would look at this a situation like this and the first thing I jump is, hey, robotics. We could go to something like Jason Huggins' Tapster and, hey, can we get like a fake fingerprint that always works and you push it with the little, the little robot finger? Okay, there's that. Or maybe we understand that these are things that today humans are better at. Humans are better at touching physical things and that's just the way it works. What are computers good at? Computers are good at ripping through a bunch of data and ripping through a bunch of steps over and over and over, basically in the same order each time. So let's let each of the, the entities here, the humans, the testers, and then the automation the machines work at what they're, they're good at. Maybe we don't have any of that end point automation. Maybe that is all human based, sort of like video games. You're not going to have a whole lot of automation to, to, to drive the playing of a video game. You might have a lot of automation to deal with testing of messages that go back and forth and servers being up and, and telemetry and analytics and all those other types of things. Let's focus the technology on the things we know it's good at, focus the humans on the things that the technology isn't good at, and if there's a gap, a chasm there, then we start figuring out where is the value proposition? Is it in some sort of robotics? Is it in, okay, we're going to have the ability to bypass face ID in our QA environment? Risky, right? Not from a testing standpoint, but from a release standpoint. Oops, we didn't have a, we actually released this without you know, putting the, the face ID back in or the, the 2FA back in. So there's another set of, checking that has to happen on each release to make sure any of these these switches and triggers get flipped the right way on a release so that you reduce that risk profile. Got it. Okay. So in theory, it sounds like some of these more advanced security features are preventing job displacement in the form of AI taking over humans. So uh, somewhat job security, if you will, no pun intended. <laughs> that being said, <laughs> we'll go ahead and switch over now that we're talking about humans to uh, what are the best team roles or tester archetypes uh, that are most likely to ensure success when you're talking about building a QA team in FinTech? So Q2 has embraced the whole team model and it's been really successful. Um, you know, we firmly believe that quality is a collective responsibility, not just the job of the quote unquote QA person. We all own, 
delivering a quality application to our financial institutions. And by having cross-functional teams who own their ethics and own their stories and together, you know, have eyes on them from a bunch of different perspectives, we are going to do a better job delivering. You know, product understands the customer need and what the acceptance tests are. Dev and test design and implement code, both source code and automation code, to flesh out the feature and ensure that it meets the requirements. And all the members of the team need to have a deep understanding of the system, how it works, what are the implications of this new feature or enhancement, and how will that impact existing functionality. So I think the, the success in FinTech is not looking at it as if it's the QA team's job, but looking at it like it's, it's something that, um, you know, it is, again, a collective responsibility that we all have a role in. Here, here. Uh, I, I, I totally agree with that, and I would say that that is um, that is definitely what I am seeing across the board, not just in fintech. Uh, the 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 quality so so quality and and correctness can't be tested in. It has to be built in from the beginning. So when we think about it from that point. Everybody has to have a hand in quality. Everybody has to have a hand in testing, even if not everybody is pressing keys and moving mice and things like that to do the testing. Everybody has a hand in the notion of testability and and the, the associated pieces like controllability, observability, automation, automatability, all of those aspects. So, yes, full team role. And what I would say is when we start talking about the test or QA team in particular, I would say the same skills, the same testing skills largely should apply across pretty much any vertical that we're talking about. Uh, then we start getting into the differences of, oh, okay, now I'm in FinTech. Well, I need to understand that particular uh, that particular vertical, I need to know the ins and outs of of how loans are made or how taxes work or, or whatever. And then I go into um, healthcare and I need to know how these contracts are managed or the these collections are made. And those particular things are the add-ons. But you should, if you are a the best testers that I know, the best QA people that I know, can switch verticals without a whole lot of problem because the same skills are largely needed. And one of the main skills is sort of the, this critical thinking, lateral thinking, understanding how how systems are put together, and then the applied learning of, hey, I did work in healthcare. I understand that I'm going to have similar issues or similar considerations in the financial tech world simply because we're dealing with private data, simply we're dealing with transient data, we're dealing with um, – data integrity issues across multiple different databases or data types or whatever it is. And then the implementation, the specifics are obviously going to be different. But once you can take the applied learning and understand that you're looking at something very similar, then you can you can be a lot more effective a lot more quickly at the at the role because you're able to make that leap quicker. So people that understand and can apply that, I think they're key in any testing or QA organization. Great, and I heard quite a few good things there, but one that stands out to me outside of the specific skills and kind of test philosophies uh, regarding the individual is that it sounds like the best thing for the success of a QA organization and a company at large is uh, an all hands on deck approach, which brings me to the next point um, regarding shift left. So uh, given the rise of shift left as a concept, how do you see the dynamics between product management and QA changing uh, today and a little bit into the future? Yeah, so, so I, I think you're absolutely right, Drew. That this ties back to the whole team or cross-functional team model again. You know, our product owners sit in the same pods as our developers and testers and designers. They're in stand-up together. They're in sprint planning together. They're in demos together. I mean, they, they, are, they are a team. Um, and they've got a very close relationship um, versus a more traditional setup you know, that we saw last century when I started working, um, where, you know, requirements came to us from, uh, you know, a document and faceless humans um, that lived far, far away. Um, today, it's a much closer-knit team working together to deliver. And, and I think that that only brings goodness um, 
you know, when it comes to the end result. Yeah, I I agree. Uh, the the whole shift left or shift up, shift down, <laughs> shift every direction. Uh, you, when you read a whole lot about the uh, uh, testing in in QA uh, landscape right now, you hear all sorts of different terminologies around uh, which direction we should or should not be shifting. But yeah, I agree. The the whole team approach has to be there. It, otherwise, you're going to be limited in what it is that you can do, what it is that you can test, and the amount of and the amount of risk you can help uncover through a testing activity. Because the way I, I look at a testing activity, and I wasn't always this way, I've, I've had the, uh, the, the good fortune to work with some really, really high functioning uh, test and QA people over the last like 10 or 12 years uh, that have really good healthy thoughts, I think, on, on how testing is and, and what it should be doing. But it's less of a, a cop, right? Testing and QA should not be the, the the, the quality police, they should sort of be more the stewards of quality, right? Responsible, but not the ones that are sitting there saying yes, no, go, no, go. That should be a, a business decision made with information that's come from the entire team. So if the entire team is not sufficiently working at a, a with like a quality lens on, they're not going to be able to answer those questions with a sufficiently quality focused uh, mindset. Got it. Both great answers. And Paul, I think we just discovered a new buzzword in quality police. I'm gonna say <laughs> oh, no, that's not. I'm sure that's something that is far, 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 probably even older than me, um, which if oh, you can wow. believe that. Um. <laughs> well, you got Jan talking about starting work last century. So, you know. <laughs> yeah, well, my age starts with a five. So I'm, I'm right there. I'm right there. <laughs> Okay, great. So we are at the last panel question here, um, and we'll take a few steps back and try to apply it to QA at large here. Uh, the question going first to Jan is, how can teams outside of fintech apply these same principles, especially when we're talking about uh, the meticulousness that goes into, um, you know, detailed planning and, and testing and things of that nature? Yeah, yeah. So, you know, Drew, I think honestly everything we've talked about today applies to FinTech as well as other industries. I mean, building good software means having self-directed, cross-functional teams who understand their stakeholders. And regardless of, of who we are and, and what we're doing, we should all follow good, solid software engineering best practices. Um, we should think about test design, we should think about automation strategy, and we should, whole, as a whole team, strive to deliver quality applications that delight our end users. Yeah, and I'll, I'll echo that as well. I think everything that, that you would, again, outside of the, the specific domain specifics, I would not say that anything is necessarily going to be in particular specific to fintech that's not applicable to other areas when it comes to the actual testing approaches testing strategies testing techniques uh the things we look for the, the type of things we look for uh the ways we approach different aspects here the only thing that might change is the business proposition so if you're testing something in fintech you're probably going to spend a lot more time on testing and quality than you are with say a 99 cent game that you wrote in your spare time and rolled out into the the Amazon or the uh, the Android app store. You're not going to hire a team of testers to do that. There, there, there's the value is not there, but you're certainly going to have a team of testers or at least some people with testing responsibilities in a fintech organization or, or in an organization where you're starting to deal with money, whether it's other people's money or whether you're bringing in money to for your corporation, whatever it is, once you start talking about money or health, either from the altruistic nature of you don't want to screw up the people that are working uh, using your software or from the more um, mercenary nature of we can't be in the news, we can't deal with a lawsuit, we can't deal with these other things. All of this gets blended into your business approach and and you build your testing around the risks that you are willing to take and that you can mitigate and that you can handle if that comes true, right? Because the last thing a major company wants is to have their name on the front page of the newspaper or CNN or, or, or newspaper is still a thing. So, <laughs> um, so yeah, you don't want to be that. You don't want to be on there. So 
you get these questions of CIOs and CTOs of what keeps you up at night. The, the real answer is being on the front page of the paper in a negative way. Uh, we, we go back to AI and, and, and it's Microsoft. So Microsoft, certain companies have a certain amount of latitude on things. But if you Google Microsoft Tay, uh, the, the first item I think is, no, the first item is uh, internet teaches AI bot to be racist teenager in one day or something like that. The second item is the Google entry on micro, Microsoft Tay. Um, you don't want to be, you don't, you don't want your Google entries to come back with something really negative, right? So if I'm going to Google company X, I want to see their website first, uh, some positive news in there. I don't want to see all the, oh, wait, major outage, major breach, um, banking, snafu, any of those types of things. I, as, as a consumer, as a potential client, I'm going to go, yeah, who else does this for me? Right, right. Yeah, fantastic points. I mean, takeaway there, CYA, no matter what industry you're in. Um, okay, great. So uh, that said, we will go ahead and open it up to some audience questions. Uh, looks like we have a few already funneling in, and so I'll go ahead and start on those while uh, some other people contribute. Um, and this one looks like it's aimed at Jan. Jan, you said that financial companies are risk averse. Uh, just curious, do you think that means that QA gets more love in financial organizations precisely uh, to mitigate risk? Well, I love mine more. Um, that's for sure. Um, so, so I think I think there's higher focus, there's higher scrutiny because we do understand the risk, um, you know, to, to people's lives and, and their you know personal data. Um, and so I think we have to have tighter. Um, you know, controls around who has access to what and have we done our due diligence and, and do we really understand what, the, you know, the risk is um, when we look at, you know, quality standards and, and metrics. Right. And Paul, did you want to add any color to that? I, I think on the, the QA or testing love, that really is a an organization by organization and company by company um, sort of culture. You know, I, I grew up in the world that uh, professionally that the testers were the, the computer science graduates who didn't code well. And that, that's what I thought my first couple of years till I started working with some really talented testers and went, wait a minute, that, that, that's not true. That's not true. It's a different discipline. But somewhere along the way, testing got a, a, a sort of a second class citizenry um, uh, a label slapped on it, and we are now starting to come out of that in most organizations. You don't see that nearly as much as you used to even five years ago, and certainly not 10 years ago. Um, so I think in general, testers in QA are going to get a little more love, but uh, from a from a standpoint of in fintech, is it better than any other tech? I, my experience has been org to org and company to company. That makes sense. Everyone's snowflake. Okay, so uh, another one here, and I believe both of you can answer this. Um, this is the first time I've heard of combinatorial test design. Thanks for that. Uh, is this purely a strategy or is this a methodology that has to be supported by your QA tech stack? Ooh, yes, I'm glad, I'm cool. yay person that was listening. Um, so combinatorial <laughs> test design is a, is a test design methodology. There are some commercial tools out there that, um, that you know, you can use to do CTD. Um, you, can, you can also do it by hand. It's just more of a pain to sit down with pen and paper and, and, and you know, draw it all out. Um, combinatorial test design is also sometimes referred to as pairwise testing. Um, you know, and so basically you're looking at um, for each set of inputs or things that would, you know, cause the code to, to branch in a different direction, what are the equivalence classes or what are the buckets, you know, that, that kind of the, would cause those paths to branch? And then looking and making sure that you have every pair or, you know, every triplet of combinations covered at least once. Um, I'll put a plug out there for HexaWise. Um, that's the tool that we're using here. Uh, to do CTD modeling. Um, there are others, though, out there. I, I, I Personally, I think HexaWise has the richest feature set. Um, so you can Google it um, and, and take a look. Yeah, pretty much everything Jan just said there. Uh, the, the only, I'll, I'll, I'll be the storm cloud, is that 
you have to understand that when you use these, you, what you're saying is these three inputs together are sufficiently similar to these other 15 or 30 or 1,000 three inputs together. And by testing the one set of these three inputs, I am sufficiently de-risking the workflow and the, the quality or de-risking the, 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 the testing of these other pieces here. But you haven't actually tested those. So you have to know more about the code. The more you know about the code and that you're happy with those particular flows through, you can say, okay, it's I, I've the risk is down because I do know what the implementation is. Um, what you're doing is you're you're shifting your risk-based testing instead of saying, I'm going to test this feature and not this feature. What we're saying is we're going to test a subset of these features, but we're going to do it intelligently. We're going to we're going to look at the data. We're going to look at the input. We're going to use tools that help us figure this stuff out, and say these inputs are sufficiently similar to all these other ones. So I am going to just test this one set of inputs, telling the stakeholders, here's how we tested this. There is some risk in here, but because we've done these other parts of the investigation, the risk is probably probably suitable and an acceptable risk, what do you think? And maybe you don't just test three, maybe you test, instead of testing a thousand or three, maybe you just test like two or three triplets or pairs or, or whatever it is. Whatever you need to do to get the risk profile into where you need it to be, that's where you should spend your testing time. But yeah, taking, knowing that we can't test everything, this is a totally appropriate way to go through if you understand what risk you're signing up for. Makes sense, thank you for that. Okay, um, as I move my as I move my team through sprints, I like core tech examples include core data, relational databases, and data flow. I like the core tech uh, to be unit tested first before a UX or UI is built. I like to build what is an automated regression test suite. How would you manage this regression test suite? Uh, and would that be via Git tools, et cetera, or any thoughts that you have on that? Um, so our, our regression suites live in repos in the same get projects as our source code. Um, you know, I, I believe strongly that, you know, the code needs to live with the code. Um, and then, you know, we, for kind of our tech stack, we use Jenkins to execute regression on, you know, a regular basis and then, um, you know, reports out to our test management tool. Um, you know, if, if you're starting from scratch, then I think, um, you know, I always would suggest teams start with an automated smoke test first, just so that you can kind of get your feet wet and figure out what you're dealing with in terms of automation. From there, move from a smoke test to a regression, you know, bucket um, that you, again, if you've, if you've done good test design, you know exactly what needs to go into it so it's maintainable and, and robust. Um, and then, you know, once you've kind of caught up or in parallel, um, automate the, the new features that you have coming along. Yeah, and I will echo the fact that this is um, this is code. Uh, even if you're doing something that's recording playback, if you're doing drag and drop, if whatever it is that whatever you're doing at the very top doesn't look like C Sharp or Java or, or Ruby or whatever, somewhere in that stack, there, there, there's code. You've sequenced some things together. Uh, maybe you have some logic on did this pass, did this not pass. That's code. That's code. And you have to treat it the same way. So it has to be preserved. It has to be stored like in a version repository, like Jan was just saying, uh, big fan of that. Uh, it needs to be reviewed. It needs to be maintained. When it is no longer providing value, you need to call it. You need to get rid of the things that aren't providing value. Uh, you will add to it. You will modify it. You'll transition it to new versions of the tool. So there's a maintenance activity that needs to be uh, accounted for in your planning there. So treating the whole thing like a software endeavor uh, is, is really the right way to go because it really is a software endeavor. So if you're struggling with how should I go about this, we'll talk to some people that develop software professionally for a living. Uh, fortunately, you probably have some that sit right over the wall from you that you can go and ask, uh, where should we put these things? Great. And that echoes something we've heard of Kobaton a few times in that the best way to approach testing philosophy is to treat it like a software development project. Uh, so I do appreciate that tad bit there, Paul. Um, okay, next question. And Jan, this is likely going to be uh, aimed at you first, and then Paul, if any color 
uh, that'd be great. So I'm building up a team for a FinTech initiative. How would you find the HR talent and what exact roles would you hire for? For example, one manual and one automated tester, um, and then what skill sets, i.e. JavaScript, other languages, Docker, et cetera? Um, so I would want everyone to have a automation skill. Um, even if they're coming from a manual test background um, and they may not you know, write Python code on Saturday for fun, they, I would want to look for folks that have a working knowledge of, um, you know, uh, of how to automate, how to write the code. Um, you know, I honestly think the hardest skill to find, you know, from, from a management position, you know, from, from my current team as well as organizations that I've managed in the past, the hardest skill to find isn't, um, you know, that development skill. It, it's finding good test design and folks that have a fundamental understanding of the levels and types of tests and what's appropriate to be tested when and what are all the different um the different things that we need to be taking into consideration, all the way from unit test to integration to function test to system test to solution test, non-functional requirements. And it gets a little overwhelming when you start thinking all the things you need to be doing, um, but that if we don't do them, the customer is going to. And, and so we have to have that test strategy and test design you know, in our back pocket um, to be able to rely upon. Um, and, and then I think the soft skills, I, I think we underplay the value of soft skills and looking for people that are excited and engaged and, and want to learn and want to grow and, and you know, continue to, to move the ball forward. Because that can make a huge, huge impact on the team, even if they don't walk in the door with the technical skills that you want and getting you to where you need to go to. Yes, I'll... Uh... Just pretend I repeated everything that she just said. Uh, <laughs> and then my, my, my own little flavor there is we've tried to do that a couple of different organizations where we would hire the, the testers we would hire in would be good testers and knew how to code. What happened was in one case we ran out. We couldn't find enough people with the skills that we needed. And in another case, we couldn't afford all of them. So what we had to do was be strategic and not so much well you always have to be strategic with who you hired but once you hired them in being further strategic about how you seeded and built up the teams whether you had them embedded in delivery teams whether you had them in sort of a more community of practice where they were more like a shared resource uh, there are no wrong ways to do it as long as you're getting business value out of it and, and then the way that I've kind of looked at automation after that after failing with those attempts or, or at least failing with my my first foray with those attempts to to do that kind of hiring was um, looking at automation as as sort of concentric circles where everybody needs to be able to execute the automation and understand and triage the results. If we can't do that, we hired the wrong person or our automation system substandard or maybe both, right? So there, there there's there's work to be done on both sides of that fence potentially. Then the next level out would be, okay, I might not be able, I might not have the chops to write all this stuff from scratch, but certainly I can make minor changes in data, uh, minor changes in, uh, in an algorithm where, oh, wait, this locator's changed or this field has changed from an integer to a string or, or whatever it is to be able to handle those levels. And then the higher level would be those that are actually creating new test scripts and then supporting them and able to execute them all as well. And looking at your talent pool as an amalgam of all of those things and then staffing appropriately based on what you need in any particular team. But I'll also say that I like the idea of, wow, you can't code, you don't, you've never learned how, but man, you're a great tester. I'll bring you in and I will teach you how to code, or I'll teach you enough code to get you through whatever it is we need for you to do here at this company. Um, I, I'm a big fan of that as well. Great. So it sounds like, you know, great people start at the foundational level, not necessarily the skill level when it comes to building a team. Absolutely. In my opinion. Okay. Awesome. Awesome. Okay. I think we have time for one more question here. Uh, given the huge risk in releasing a buggy app uh, in financial services, who ultimately has the power to greenlight or veto 
a release? Is that QA or product management or some other group? It's the team. I fully, I fully, fully believe that it's the team. The team has to decide, you know, is the risk of releasing worth the potential consequences of, you know, what happens if we do. Um, and, and it's not just on QA, it's not just on product, it's on the team to decide. Agreed, agreed, absolutely. Um, the the business sector may not understand the risks of what was and wasn't tested, um, what that, that impact might be. Uh, the QA team does not necessarily understand the business impact. Hey, we shouldn't go, we have this error, but yes, if we don't deliver this week, then we're gonna lose this $100 billion account. Um, we 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 have to release, right? Even if it breaks some of the other stuff that that account doesn't care about, we're just gonna have to suck that up and deal with it and go. And it's an unfortunate position to be in to have to do things like that, but such is the nature of business decisions, risk assessment and and uh, and risk tolerance. That does have to be a team uh, decision. And usually the final go, no go, even in that team is gonna come from somebody either in a, a, at a VP level, at a C level, um, uh, outside of the, the, the everybody sitting together team, but certainly, hopefully, their decisions will be informed by what the team actually has, or actually has come up with. Great, so again, all hands on deck. And I think that's a great takeaway to uh, conclude the webinar on there. Uh, so with that, I will say thank you to both Jan and Paul for joining us and giving us such great insights on today's webinar. And then I'd also like to thank the audience for participating today. Um, if you have any questions regarding anything uh, related to FinTech QA or Cobaton platform in general, um, or in general QA industry best practices, feel free to send them to marketing at Cobaton.com. We'd love to hear from you. Um, and otherwise, until next time. So thanks everyone and have a great day.